afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Whether you're a farmer or a consumer, we are all impacted by dairy prices. For the dairy farmer, the price they get paid for their milk has to feed their family and sustain their business. For the consumer, dairy prices affect everything from milk and cheese to yogurt and butter. So to help us understand the economics of dairy farming and dairy products, we've called on one of the nation's most respected agricultural economists. I want to welcome Bob Wellington. Bob is the Senior Vice President of Economics, Communications and Legislative Affairs for the Dairy Farmer Cooperative Agrimark. He works closely with the Department of Agriculture in all six New England states, plus the state of New York. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. What is the current economic situation for dairy farmers in our region? Well, it's, it's a struggle. Their farmers are facing milk prices um, that are lower um, than their cost of production for just about every farm that I'm aware of. And the problem is that they've struggled with this uh, for the last three years. This will actually be the fourth year that they're facing that. So they haven't had an opportunity to have a good you know, year or two where they could maybe retire some debt or lower some costs. Um, so they're in, in, in the worst possible situation um, that has been ongoing for such a long period of time. What are the main factors accounting for the low milk prices that are being paid to farmers? Well, it's a combination. It's the basic economics of supply and demand. Um, but it's not just the supply uh, that's going on here in Vermont or New York. Um, because right now, actually, milk production is down in both those states. Uh, but it's supply across the country. U.S. milk production is up almost 2%. And then at the same time, um, internationally, you're having huge growth overseas. Uh, Europe got rid of their quotas, and they're up about 5%. That's a, a humongous amount of milk, because the European countries combined produce one and a half times as much as all the United States. Wow. Yeah, so it, it, that, that, that creates a lot of problems on the supply side, not generated by local farmers. And then on the demand side, the demand has very, been very strong for products like butter and cheese. But on other products that are companion products, like uh, non-fat dry milk, you make a pound of butter, you get two and a half pounds of non-fat dry milk you have to sell. Well, those prices have collapsed. Non-fat dry milk prices are lower than they were when I started in the industry about 40 years ago. Wow. I, it's incredible. And the same thing with cheese. Uh, uh, Cabot makes a pound of cheese. They have nine pounds of, of whey they have to dry and then sell that product, usually overseas. That price has gone for farmers just in the last year. Farmers are getting 30 cents a pound for those components in whey. Now they're getting five cents a pound, and it's just, it, it just adds to their, their total lower price. In fact, that's really what's driving prices more than anything, is those dry companion products sold overseas. Mm -hmm. And so dairy farmers are used to price fluctuations, and as an agricultural economist, you've seen these cycles for decades. Is 2018 more of the same, or is the current situation different, well, and how? Well, it's, it's different in that um, it's a, it's a fourth year where there has been no level of significant recovery. Mm -hmm. um, in 2014, milk prices went up to a, a, a strong level, and most farmers I talked to could cover their cost of production and even retire debt, prepare for the future. But you would expect that in a three-year cycle that, yeah, you would have had a tough 2015, 2016, which they did. But then 2017 was expected to be a recovery, and it was a very small level of recovery. It got maybe a dollar or two dollars a hundred weight, which went, which was you know, still below cost of production for just about all farms. So they haven't had that level of recovery they needed to try to um, prepare for another downturn, and now we're in another downturn. Does it matter what size farm we're talking about? It, it can matter a little bit on it. Um, there's different strengths that different size farms have. Um, larger farms may have some economies of scale to help lower their costs. On the other hand, smaller farms may be able to diversify better and do things like uh, selling maple syrup, uh, woodlots, um, farm stands. There's a lot of things. Farmers are. Farmers in, in the Northeast are very, very innovative, and uh, it's unfortunate that they have to work so many different jobs to cover their, 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 their cost of, of making milk that doesn't cover its own cost. It's, it's an outright shame. 
And so do you think these rather significant price fluctuations are going to continue in the future, say five, ten years down the road? Um, I think they will because it's not just it's not just what's happening locally, it's and it's not even just what's happening nationally now. It's what's happening internationally. But I do believe that there's going to be a continued strong demand for dairy products. Dairy protein in particular is the most digestible protein there is, and we have a very hungry world. And there's a lot of people out there who don't get enough food and who don't get enough protein. And if, we, if they can have their income rise enough or their government makes that decision to help support that, I think dairy's got a bright future, uh, particularly on the protein side, which is lagging right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the fat will take care of itself. Fat is flavor. Butter, ice cream, those things. I'm not worried about their future. But in terms of the dry protein products, there should be a very bright future. We just have to get over this hump, and then we have to make decisions to feed people around the world uh, adequately. Well, it's hard to believe that our little state of Vermont is competing against the rest of the world. In fact, milk exports in the United States can have a big impact on the prices we've talked about for farmers. Uh, what happens in Russia and China has a huge impact, and of course, there's no way to control that, really. No, there isn't. Um, and it's surprising. For example, um, we take all the whey from our cheese plants that make our cabbage uh, cheeses, and we, we dry it and make whey protein products and, and regular whey products in Middlebury, Vermont. And um, we sell most of those in China. And we have a really strong demand. They love Vermont products. It's very high quality um, because we make white cheddar that our, our whey is, is white colored as opposed to like a yellow cheddar. Mm -hmm. And so they really like our, like our products. So that's very helpful on doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to us. Um, even Vermont products, I mean, you look at the two key dairy products that I would say in Vermont are ice cream, Ben and Jerry's, and cheese, such as Cabot. Mm -hmm. And um, those are sold, you know, Ben and Jerry's is sold around the world now, and Cabot's getting to the point where it's sold in almost every market in the United States and very doing very well. And yet a 1% or 2% change in pricing has a dramatic impact locally. It does. It, 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 it does. Because when there's um, uh, a change in production or a change in demand, um, the very nature of milk um, it implies a multiplied price effect. Milk is perishable. If there's too much milk, okay, you can't put it in the barn or a bulk tank and have and wait a, a couple more days or weeks or months. That milk has to be picked up at least every other day, and it has to find an immediate home. So it's pasteurized. It's turned into cheese. It's turned into butter. If it can't find a home, then literally it has to be dumped. And so rather than dumping and get no value. Farmers will compete against each other and lower the price. So just a small amount of extra milk could drive that price down. On the other hand, consumers want milk and they mm -hmm. want dairy products. So if there's a if there's a short supply, milk handlers want to get that milk, so they'll bid that price up substantially. So it creates those swings on milk, which can be very positive for farmers, but also very detrimental. And so in February, you wrote a letter to Agrimark Farmers, and the letter highlighted suicide prevention hotlines and mental health services. There's a lot of concern for farmers. This is a, a far bigger toll it can be taking than just a financial toll. It, it, it is. And that, would, that, that letter was brought out of concern that we've had um, talking to some of our farmers, um, some incidences. Um, that were very troublesome on farms. And we wanted to make sure that farmers had all that information, particularly dealing with uh, financial and personal stress on the farms. And yes, there are some lines that are suicide lines or whatever. You know, we, we felt obliged that we would include that with all that information. But the, the, the situa situation is bad. Uh, on the farms. And actually that letter has been passed around the entire country and it really highlighted a lot of discussion from the farm level family, a family members discussing it here in Vermont, to legislators across the country saying, is this that bad? Senator Leahy passed it around to his, his other senators and they called back to their states and they found out, by God, it is as bad all over. So it set that tone, which is very, very unfortunate. Uh, but most farmers, you know, they, they, you know, they, they know how to handle these situations, and I, I, you know, I think anybody can can use help on dealing with the stress issues. I'm not as worried about the other issues. 
uh, on, on, on farms, but we have to be aware of it. And even if a letter like that helped even one or two farm families, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. So over many years, farmers and major dairy companies have opposed efforts to enact a quota system for milk production. Do you think that time has come that there should be a quota system? Well, Agrimark is a dairy cooperative, has looked at quota systems quite a bit. And we actually supported pieces in it, like when we had an, a former Northeast Dairy Compact. Mm -hmm. We looked at the current um, margin protection program that's part of the farm bill. And um, when we were developing that, we had developed some quota language nationally that looked like it was going to get passed. And at the last minute, Congress said, no, they didn't like it. And some farmers out west said, no, they didn't like it. So it, it's been very difficult to try to get quotas into place. Quotas don't work if it's only in a state like a Vermont or the Northeast. Now, even in the U.S., because if we cut our production, farmers in Europe or New Zealand would be happy to right. produce more milk and take those markets. So it becomes even more of a difficult situation to balance supplies you know, and, and to raise price with quotas. Can you explain how the margin protection program works? Sure. Um, what, what the margin protection program looks at is the amount of money that farmers need um, to cover their costs beyond feed. And um, it's, it's not just declining milk prices that they need protection from. We've had po points in the past where the feed has gone up so high that that has squeezed farmers' margins even when prices to farmers look good. So this sort of creates a minimum that farmers could pay an insurance uh, premium on and, and get covered by it. Unfortunately, there were some last minute changes back in 2014 when it was developed. And those changes um, really made the program ineffective over the last few years. So farmers came in, paid their premiums, but never really got a payment out of the program. And so a lot of farmers were discouraged. Um, in this last um, bill that went through back in January, Senator Leahy played a key role in getting crucial changes to it. They lowered the costs of the premiums that they paid, and they, they, they made it easier for farmers to step into the program during low milk prices like we're seeing this year. So we expect when USDA comes out with its new rules, hopefully, and, and they might even be out by now, um, within the next you know, week or two, at the latest we hope, that uh, they will have uh, um, the ability for farmers to step into this program, and with the low milk prices, it will be reflected, and there'll be payments back to farmers this year. And also will provide a safety net if um, prices collapse further. We don't expect that, but this is a crazy market right now, mm -hmm. and it's the politics of it. When you talk about embargoes and trade barriers, you know, Mexico, Mexico's our leading dairy importer of U.S. dairy products. China is, is, a, is a major customer of even Cabot Way. Mm -hmm. So those things can have a big impact. So farmers need a safety net. That program has not been a safety net. We think that with the changes that were engineered by Senator Leahy, that those, 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 that safety net will be much better. You know, we've talked about this before. Consumers still hear that farmers are getting record low prices for the milk they produce, yet prices really haven't changed in the supermarket. So they're wondering, well, where's all the money going? Sure, sure. Um, that's because the, the prices set in the supermarket um, are set by whatever the retailer decides those prices should be. Um, and there's a lot of factors. Uh, competition's a very big factor, for example. Um, you have a situation where the population density in Vermont um, is not as great as it is um, down in the Boston area, for example. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of positives for that in Vermont, right. um, having that. But, but down in the Boston area, southern New Hampshire, where, where I live, um, you can go to four or five different grocery stores, large grocery stores, within five minutes of one another. They all compete, they have a lot of business, and because of that, they often have lower prices. So they, we have seen prices start to decline. I think it's, it's probably hard for some people to believe, but in southern New Hampshire, I, I've gone to the store and bought milk for $2.50 a gallon on a regular basis. Last month it was $2 a gallon. Mm -hmm. I mean, so some of it does get passed along, but there's also some costs involved that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, eventually the prices will fall into play, um, but it depends on those, those conditions. You optimistic? I, it's, I've, I've worked with dairy farmers my entire career for the last 40 years, and they are some of the most optimistic people you have in the world. And they're, they're wonderful people to work with. I have such tremendous regard for them. So I can't help but say, what are the positives we can come from this? 
Uh, I think the biggest positive is that we live in a hungry world, and we live in a world that's deficit of food and particularly of high-value protein. There is no better digestible protein in the world than dairy protein. And so I think that if the world and its countries decided to feed its people properly in a proper diet, dairy would be a huge part of that. And I don't think we could make enough milk at this point to, to, to meet their needs. But that has to be a decision uh, around the world mm -hmm. to feed people properly for incomes as they start to rise. So I think that's going to happen. And when that happens, um, I think that there'll be resurgence on those prices, particularly those depressed prices that I mentioned on non-fat dry milk and whey, which are dairy protein. Bob, thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.